During services, the prophet stared at the people on the left side of the room, for the photograph captured the right side of the prophet's face. For as long as I could remember, visitors and members of the Branham Tabernacle sat in pews silently while listening to a 1947 to 1965 recorded sermon of the prophet. As they listened, they sat facing the prophet's image with God hanging above his head in the blurred image of light. For me, sitting through the sermons while looking at the halo relic made the sermon feel more alive. It felt as if there were a spiritual bond between the listener, me, and the prophet. I was surprised the first time I saw old photographs of the prophet's early church. It was one thing to use the halo photo as a frame of reference for an image of the speaker that we listened to every Wednesday evening and two times on Sunday. It was entirely different, however, to think about the prophet standing in front of a photo of the prophet. Yet as I looked at the early photographs of the prophet in his church, this is exactly what happened. That same image of the halo hung on the wall near the pulpit while the prophet was alive, and the prophet could turn and look at himself hanging on the wall. I began to think about how strange it would be for a preacher in this position. What if every preacher had a picture of themselves behind the pulpit? It would not take long before the congregation began to wonder if the focal point of the sermon was supposed to be on God or the preacher whose portrait hung on the wall staring at them. Above the pulpit hung a familiar Bible verse, and under normal circumstances it would have seemed less eerie. In bold, thick, black letters just above the prophet's enlarged photograph read the verse from Psalm 46.10 in the Bible, Be still and know that I am God. As a child, I remember looking up at the words, I am God, looking down at the prophet's halo, and then looking back at the words on multiple occasions. Even in my youth, I wondered if anyone else saw the irony in those words and their location, not yet realizing that this was likely the intent. In later years, the prophet made it clear that it was not his voice that we were listening to, but it was God speaking through him to us. He told us how Jesus Christ was returning to earth in the form of a prophet, and I just knew that our prophet was THE prophet. I was being still, but I was confused as to who was God. I never knew that I was supposed to believe the prophet was God, and I always found it odd that some sects within the message did believe just that. I began to wonder what it was like in the prophet's church before that psalm quotation plaque was hung above the pulpit. In the early photographs of the church, it was not there. Specifically, I was curious to learn more about the church before the prophet was the center of focus. Looking over the old photographs of the church, I found that there were very few relics hanging on the wall. Most of the ones that we had in our churches came much later, but it was odd seeing the walls without the relics that I had always seen in message churches. Suddenly, while looking at the old photographs of the Branham Tabernacle, I noticed something even more unusual than the I am God sign above the pulpit. The early photographs of the church depicted a building that was much taller than the building in the newer photographs. I knew the building in the new photographs well. Not only was it my grandfather's church, but it was also a sacred building that many of us knew inside and out. The early photographs were not the same building. The 1936 tabernacle on 8th and Penn Streets was only slightly taller than the side windows, but the photographs we had of the early congregation were taken inside of a building that was at least 15 feet taller. There was no way that the prophet's early church, as we were told, would fit inside the Branham Tabernacle. Two large beams clearly taller than the church building that I had attended for several years of my life stretch from the floor to the lower ceiling of the building in the older photograph. Above those beams, a much higher ceiling stretched above the visible part of the photograph. On the beam to the right, it looked as though a plaque was positioned just above the heads of the adults as they passed by, but it could not be read due to the reflection of light from the camera. When the prophet talked about some verses painted on the church beams, he mentioned Sammy Davison painting them. I remembered an article that I'd found in the Jeffersonville local newspaper 
which describe the music program at the Prophet's Early Church. The special program, according to the newspaper, was directed by Santi Davidson. I wondered, was this Santi the same person as Sammy? And also, who exactly was this man directing music at the Prophet's Church? Why was he chosen by the Prophet, and why was he never mentioned? The answer came while I was studying the connections of the men involved with the Prophet that were associated with Freemasonry. I found that some groups within the Masonic Order published names of their higher-ranking members, a practice that seemed unusual today. Today, Freemasonry is notorious for their secretive practices and lack of public membership listing. Surprisingly, this was not the case in the 1930s. Santi Davidson, the Prophet's first music minister, was a ranking member of the Independent Order of Odd Fellows. According to newspapers, Santi Davidson led the devotional services at the Billy Branham Pentecostal Tabernacle. In the Prophet's accounts of his early church, he mentioned temporarily using the Masonic Hall for services. Santi was likely involved with opening the Masonic doors to the Pentecostal Church as it transitioned from Roy E. Davis to the Prophet. He was a skilled painter, so it was not surprising that he also painted the signs that hung in the early church. Santi was deeply involved with the Independent Order of Oddfellows Masonic Order and featured in photographs published in the Louisville Courier Journal describing members of rank. In 1925, Santi Davidson's photo was featured as rank of guardsman or bodyguard. Having a rank of bodyguard would imply that he had been involved with the secret meetings for some time and trusted enough to keep others out. According to the Jeffersonville and New Albany, Indiana newspapers, Santi had been participating in the Odd Fellows activities since as early as 1902. At that time, Santi was listed as an officer in the Tabor Lodge. Santi was deeply involved with more than one fraternal organization. He was also a deputy grand chancellor of the Knights of Pythias. In 1915, Santi was president of the Order of the Owls. This group helped fund orphans and widows. Though a member of the Jeffersonville Lodge and participating in the Prophets, and likely Roy E. Davis's Jeffersonville Church, Santi lived in Salem, Indiana. His role as choir master did not begin with the Billy Branham Pentecostal Tabernacle. In 1901, he was appointed choir master of the Wall Street Sunday School. His painting of signs did not begin with the Bible verses on church beams. Santi had a business as a painter and was part of the Masonic Painting Union. In 1909, Santi attempted to focus solely upon painting, which apparently was a dangerous trade. At one point, Santi poisoned his eye in an accident and lost a middle finger. In the evenings, Santi managed the Etzer Opera House. The Opera House provided vaudeville entertainment to Southern Indiana and attracted visitors from all around the country. Santi was also involved with band concerts and directed the band accompaniment for local events. He was a writer who published humorous, thought-provoking articles in the local newspapers. His The Ten Commandments was aimed at local business owners, which would have been humorous to many. He also wrote poetry to encourage those out of work and articles to focus on the family. Santi operated the Snow Drip, a restaurant with sandwiches and cold drinks. He was a shrewd businessman, wheeling and dealing to make his establishments become the exclusive local attraction. And he cornered more markets than just vaudeville and motion picture. Within just a few years, he grew the Opera House large enough to attract big shows. Some of the shows, such as Fine Feathers, were so entertaining that they ran 156 nights in New York and six months in Chicago. In 1930, shortly before the time Roy E. Davis was the music minister for Ralph Rader, and before Davis took a large part of Rader's congregation, the Odd Fellows attended Ralph Rader's tent revival. Santi Davidson led the singing. The Pentecostal Baptist Tabernacle and Roy Davis were there. The prophet said that he was Davis' assistant pastor in 1930, so it is quite possible that this could have been the first time Santi Davidson met the prophet and it could have been the moment in time that connected the two. It was the first published account of a cooperative effort between Santi Davidson, Roy E. Davis, 
and according to the timeline established by research linking the two men, the Prophet. The union of fraternal organizations and Christianity were not well received in the community. Reverend Ralph Rader was forced to hold his meetings at the Knights of Pythias Armory, and it's safe to assume that Santi Davidson was involved simply due to his rank. Local ministers saw the non-denominational strategy as a threat because Rader, Davis, and others were using that platform to grow their new churches. In the case of Roy E. Davis and Ralph Rader, they were growing their churches by persuading members from other congregations to leave their home church. Two days after Roy E. Davis was arrested for violation of the Mann Act, arrested at the ongoing church revival in Jeffersonville, a resolution to prevent this practice was passed. I began to think about the unusual circumstances during the revival meetings that connected these men. Santi Davidson would have met Reverend Roy Davis for the first time, met the prophet, who was Davis's assistant pastor at the time, and witnessed federal agents taking Davis away for underage sex with a minor from another state. After Roy Davis's Pentecostal church was burned, and the Davis brothers left town in 1934, leaders of Roy Davis's Pentecostal church, George D. Ark and others, became elders in Branham's Pentecostal tabernacle. Yet with all of this going on, Santi Davidson joined Branham as his choir master. His first publicized appearance in the Billy Branham Pentecostal Tabernacle was October 2, 1935. It was not advertised on 8th and Penn Streets, however. Santi's participation in Branham's church in 1935 was at the 8th and Graham Street Tabernacle, two and a half blocks away from the Branham Tabernacle that exists today.